Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Fresh Trip Podcast, man. It's Money Monday. We heard Paul Alex from ATM, ATM together. Let's and, get into it, guys. Get him. Yeah, and get him as well as here. Where's homies? Get him, nigga. Let's get it. <laughs> back what's up guys welcome to the fresh shit podcast man quick announcement before we get into the show number one patreon.com slash fresh check us out there if you guys want to get all the behind the scenes content then we put up the clip of me kicking out that girl last week we did man it is there along with other behind the scenes videos Damn. wink wink all right and then also check us out on megaphone guys we're no longer on anchor slash spotify slash apple we're now on megaphone so if you want to listen to us on the go go ahead and check us out on megaphone uh links are below we got two different ones one for fresh and fit and one for fresh fit after hours so if you want to learn about making money check us out on fresh fit if you guys want to learn about dealing with annoying ass chicks go ahead and check us out on the fresh and fit after hours episodes and then also guys check us out on discord at discord.gg slash fresh and fit and then also get the merch at fresherpodcast.com we got all gang. the t-shirts and hoodies you guys have come to learn and love and then also check out our clips channel guys we post three clips on there per day and we're also starting to post shorts on there as well um because you know their shorts are hitting the algo a little bit better nowadays so fresh and fit clips guys help us reach three hundred thousand on that one so that we could surpass all the haters and then also check fresh's vlog out Guys, man, we're back making the date vlogs. So you guys wanted it back, we're back. And we came back with a bang, if you know what I mean. Uh, no pun intended. We did Halloween Horror Nights in Orlando. It was a great date uh, trip. And uh, it's a funny video, so check it out. And then tomorrow we'll do a live stream uh, with a surprise guest. So check it out, 100 count away. Let's go. And a giveaway as well for Jordans. Don't, don't forget that. And then uh, you guys can check me out on Fed1811. As you guys know, I break down criminal cases on that one. Uh, I just did the John Wayne Gacy killer clown uh, uh, case. Uh, basically went over, you know, his 33 murders that he done for, did from 1972 all the way to 1978 before he was caught. Um, and then I also have a Jeffrey Dahmer uh, episode up as well as I'm working on the bin Laden and CIA case right now. I just ended up filming it. It's like almost three hours, guys. But, yeah, I went ahead and documented, you know, bin Laden's past how the CIA was able to track him, and how they were able to find him in Abbottabad, Pakistan, guys. So, uh, yeah, that's going to drop on Thursday. But other than that, man, fuck all that. We got a special guest in the house. We got Paul Alex, okay? He's a fresh face you guys may have not seen before, but uh, he comes from an interesting background, a background that I share myself, and he's an entrepreneur just like myself as well. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode. This is someone you might not know, but you need to know. So, Paul, can you introduce yourself to the people real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. Man, you guys are cool. I, I love this setup, dude. Like I said, I just set, I did this setup myself. And, man, you guys are blowing it out the water. You guys got like 13 cameras and shit over here. That's Myra. <laughs> That's Myra. <laughs> Myra, you, you were doing some like CIA shit. I don't know what you were doing. Try, bro. man. I don't yeah. know. But uh, anyways, guys, <laughs> uh, my name is Paul Alex, founder of ATMtogether.com. I'm actually here with the CEO as well, Getem Jonas, uh, over there in the back. What's going on, guys? <laughs> <laughs> is this mic on? No? Yeah. Cool. All right. right on. Yeah, we're coming all the way from San Diego, guys. So we're coming from the West Coast down here to Miami. And ultimately, man, we were just out here last month. Love Miami. Been here several times. Man, you guys are living the life, especially with this view. But uh, yeah, so the story is I was in law enforcement. I was a detective for five out of the seven years in law enforcement. I worked for, you could say, a small city in the Bay Area in California, near San Francisco Bay Area. It rhymes with Copeland. Uh, <laughs> if you guys ever watch Drugs, Inc., uh, and you could say I may may not been in one of those uh, you could uh, Netflix documentaries or whatnot uh, with my face covered and all that possibly bro possibly <laughs> who knows but uh, yeah at the end of the day it was uh, it was an adventure it actually showed me a lot about myself uh, how to be a leader how to uh, actually get shit done because you need a lot of discipline and at the end of the day man I was able to transition uh, from a side hustle so the side hustle I know. A lot, I'm going to get a lot of, you know, grief because fresh. you were talking about this. You're like, hey, bro, there's, there's a couple of haters already talking shit about it. Yeah. ATMs, ATMs, you know, automated teller machines, guys. So I basically started from six ATMs, went to 30 ATMs in San Francisco Bay Area, went to five figures in passive income. Uh, within that time frame, I was still a cop. I was mm -hmm. able to buy a brand new Porsche Panamera. I was Sheesh. able to like, man, like 
I was living life, dude. Like at the end of the day, uh, I had just broke up with my ex of seven years. Uh, she was talking shit about like, oh, you're gonna go do ATMs? What what type of shit is that? Whoever who does that, you're already a detective and all that, right? Yeah. What um, does she know? I, 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 exactly, right? Mm -hmm. So, man, life life got good, man. Like, so ultimately, I was doing my side hustle while I was still in law enforcement, mm -hmm. and I transitioned. I mean, in law enforcement to get to get into it. Um, was a beat cop for like eight months. And then I went to like a specialized uh, team. How uh, old were you when you went through the academy? Shit, dude. I was like 25, 26. Okay. I'm, no. I'm currently 34 That's right, right now. That's right when I went through too. I went through at 24. Bro, if I would have gone when I was 21, I'd probably be in jail. <laughs> 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 like the mindset yeah. at, at, at that time, you know, young, I'm going to the club, you know, get bottle service and all that. And I, I mean, you, you see it when, yeah. when you guys go out and whatnot and you got all these youngsters, you know, just doing crazy and getting drunk and whatnot. I mean, you're having fun. You're experiencing it. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, uh, yeah, I went through Academy and I thought it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to front about it. I never thought I was going to be a cop. Yeah. You know, I come from uh, corporate America. I was doing sales for like six, seven years, worked my way up. I was like a glorified dish machine tech mm. for a large chemical company. And then I worked my way up to like sales. So then, you know, I was throwing the little suit. I had the little take home car. I got to work my hours. And then ultimately I was tired about, I was tired with the nine to five, bro. Mm -hmm. I was tired with the nine to five. And I was like, man, I need a change in my life. Yeah. So then my ex introduced me to her cousin who was a sergeant at the time uh, for, you know, that area, San Francisco Bay area. And then ultimately that's what got in my head that, that plant the seed in my head. And I was just like, man, if I'm going to be a cop, I'm going to be a cop in one of the most dangerous cities <laughs> out there. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and ultimately that's what I did. You know, I applied, I didn't get it the first time. Mm -hmm. And ultimately there was people with like college degrees at the time that I was applying in law enforcement, bro, there were 1600 people at the physical agility test. Wow. And I was just like, there is no way I'm going to go ahead. What year is this approximately? This is what? 2013, 2014, bro. It was 14, 2014. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 2014. I still, I still remember when I got in, it was like April, of 2014. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was the transition. And then uh got into Academy. I was in the with. Academy at the same time. That's, oh, really? That's crazy that, that, shit. That, that's trip. Now yeah. we're here, right? Yeah, we're <laughs> both in the Academy at the same time. I went in February of 2014 and you went in uh you went in April of 2014? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember I graduated because it's six months, right? Yep. So I graduated on Halloween, bro. Oh shit. <laughs> on Halloween. <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy. But um, yeah, man, now we're here. It's just it's crazy how life works and you meet good people and ultimately your network is your net worth and you guys are going to hear me saying that throughout the whole podcast so but, so as a guard yeah. as a cop right yeah it's an underrated job because the shit you guys do is legendary now as a hero being a cop there's a story behind you how did it all start like what was the childhood growing up like what was it with parents how was that for you yeah ultimately man like i i come from a low income family you know uh my mom peruvian if you guys don't know where Peru is, South America, I mean, we're in Miami. Lima. So, of course, yeah, Lima, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All the Peruvians say they're like, Lima. And then uh, my dad's Mexican. He's from Chihuahua. So at the end of the day, immigrant parents mm -hmm. came with nothing. Ultimately, uh, parents separated, very young age. And I was being raised by a single mom. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, she met my stepfather, Pablo. He's a G. He's a top G, what mm -hmm. you guys would call it. Yeah. Uh, dude's been there all my life. And ultimately, um, my mother just very hard on me, go to school. But I was a little shithead when I was in college, man. Or mm. not in college, but uh, as, as a teenager, high school. Yeah. Uh, I, me, I never envisioned getting like that four-year degree in college. Mm. And I went to community college. And then right before I transitioned to that four-year, I was just like, I'm going to go to work. Mm -hmm. You know, being Hispanic or whatnot, being a minority man, I was just like, I just got to get paid. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I went against my mother's wishes, wishes and um, I was just like, I'm just going to go work. And she's like, okay. So age 21, I, I remember I actually got the job at Corporate America two days before I turned 21. Damn. And, and so you dropped out of school. Yeah, you, you, I dropped you were out. Like, Fuck college. Okay. Yeah, I got my associates in business administration. Yeah. But at the end of the day, bro, like I didn't have no direction. Yeah. And with, majority of people don't, you know, especially when I got into law enforcement, I started starting to see these kids with no like family, no, no, no dads, no moms. And they're like, damn, what the hell am I going to do with life? Yeah. You know, and then yeah. I talked to them. I was like, well, you got these options, you know, you got this and they're not in the best neighborhood. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I could relate to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I ended up dropping out, working for a solid five, six years, law enforcement, went to academy. Uh, so you went through six months. Yeah. You get off. Now you're on, you're on the beat, right? So you're yep. on patrol. What yep. was that like? Dude, being on patrol. <laughs> they put me in the worst area. 
Okay, in the worst area. And I mean, it is what it is. I'm not going to hate on it. I respect everybody that I used to work for. I respect all my supervisors. I still show them love and everything. And I respect especially what law enforcement does nowadays. They take all the shit from Mm -hmm. society, especially the media, bad math, bad math, them. Especially nowadays. And, And at the end of the day, people don't really know what the true facts are. But you got people here like you, me, get them right here that were in law enforcement. And at the end of the day, hey, we made it happen. We got out because we saw the opportunity to better ourselves, better our lives for whatever your why was, right? And my why was ultimately my family. So at the end of the day, why am I going to go and crucify myself for people that don't even want to be protected? Uh, I was working 60 to 100 work weeks going against cartel members, going against murders. Man, I used to go and arrest these uh, child molesters by myself. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, yeah. I go look it up. We had like a top 10 wanted list and I'll go do my own investigations when I was in patrol. Yeah. Mm. So, so the eight months, that's why they pulled me out. I got volunteered by a captain was just like, hey, you're going to start writing search warrants. We're going to put you basically what they call is like a glorified patrol unit. Mm. And what it is, is it's called CRT, crime okay. reduction team. OK, so you just go for gang members and all that shit. And at the end of the day, so eight months on, they put you on an investigative group right away. Plain clothes. Right away. Right, right away, bro. Uh, people <laughs> must have hated on you for that. Oh. That's very sought after. People want to get off patrol. For those of you that are like wondering, like when you're on patrol, like for you to get off that quickly, less than a year and get into some type of investigation unit where you're, you're wearing plain clothes, it's very sought after. Bro, I'm going to tell you right now. Mm-hmm. There was so much hate um, during Academy. It was toxic. It was just like motherfuckers. I'm sure. They go in there with like they're high and tight. And I get it. You get some cats off special ops, you know, uh, Green Beret. You know, I got my boy right here. He, uh, you know, he did his thing and shit in the Marines. Yeah. And, uh, and shit. a lot of egos in the academy. Man. A lot of egos, a lot of testosterone. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I mean, I get it, but it's like, be cool. We're here for one thing. And it's just to pass academy. And at that time, they were offering six figures mm. to be a cop. And mm. this is the number one thing that we all usually get. Um, when we do marketing right now, especially yeah. me being prior law enforcement. And I love it because I'll go talk back. Yeah. I'm not scared to go ahead and uh, be sensitive online and try to like be like, no, that's going to be okay. No. So as a cop in California, you can make $200,000. Yes, you heard this right, guys. You heard it from me, actually, a prior detective. Mm. If you want to make $100,000, $200,000 with a high school diploma and you want to put in some work, you could do it in law enforcement, go travel to California, put in some work. You'll be a high ranking officer. You'll be a commander. I used to be one. I, I used to want to be a sergeant. I used to be a want to be a captain. At the end of the day, dude, I gave everything to law enforcement and I just didn't see the payback. I didn't yeah. see the longevity of it because here's the thing. My my RTO, which is your recruiting training officer in academy, you know, in his 50s, you retire as a cop in your 50s. And how the fuck is it fair in life that you die at 51? That doesn't fucking make sense. So when I go online right now and I tell him like, hey, your lifespan, if you're around my age, 34, you're about halfway there yeah. you're gonna die in your 70s majority of us are gonna die of 70s especially if you do something with adrenaline especially if you're off that high i know you guys get the high off being on the podcast and 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 talking and all well, that they tell guys this all the time when they when they leave law enforcement that uh the chances of you, you a lot of guys die like within five years of retiring and it's because they don't have something to kind of like wake up for so yeah. the, the, and that's why so many guys you know choose not to retire or they go immediately into some other field whether it's private security consulting or whatever that's where a lot of law enforcement guys go yeah after so no absolutely that makes sense yeah it does make sense man and i saw that i saw the writing in the wall bro and um to go back to the story so basically i did this unit and it was eight of us Mm -hmm. so it was eight of us out of a a department of 800 and um it was very competitive you know law enforcement is very competitive man it's just like i man i got this ak i arrested these three dudes well i mean that's cool but i got these eight kilos of coke 10 pounds of uh, heroin and then i got fucking free food rifles and shit and I just arrested that 187, a murder suspect from last year. Yeah. That's just the reality of it. It's like who's, uh, you know, thing is bigger. I don't know I if I can say that online. But misconception yeah. is people say like there's quotas or whatever <laughs> in law enforcement. It's not necessarily no. quotas. It's just that uh, law enforcement agencies are heavily driven by stats. And yep. what stats basically are, guys, is arrest seizures and being able to put up numbers. And that's how they're able to go to, right, if it's a local agency, go to the mayor, go to the you know, center, whatever it may be, and say, yo, we need more money. Or with the feds, we're able to go to Congress and be like, yo, we need more money because we did this and this and this fiscal year. So it's not that there's quotas, guys. It's that they need stats to justify and get more funding for the next year, uh, fiscal year. 
Man, Mario, I, I, I love the fact how you articulate everything, bro. Oh, I try, man. Yeah, I try. it's just like you're painting the picture because people, public right people now, bro. have that misconception, like, oh, you're a beat cop, like you're just out here writing tickets and y'all got a quota and you guys have to make this many arrests. It's not a quota to make arrests. You could do nothing if you want, guys. Like, there's trust me, there's plenty of guys that don't do shit yeah. on the job. You 100%. know, like, um, you know, most of, most of the work gets done by a small minority of the law enforcement officers. Most guys are fucking lazy, don't do shit. So, um, when they're fighting for stats or whatever, um, that's why agencies are so competitive. And fight over cases. So. so you're saying the more tickets I give out, the more arrests I do, the better for me. Tickets, not necessarily. It's more about like when you're doing like criminal investigations, it's like arrest seizures, you know, taking uh, taking guns off the street, uh, especially if you could like take guns off the street, arrest murderers, seize money, etc. You're going to be a rock star in your agency. And then they're going to be you're going to be that's how you get promoted. That's how you get uh, more respect. Um, and some guys don't want to get promoted. They want to keep doing that type of work. But. That's how you basically get a good reputation in, in your department or agency, whoever you work for. But you don't have to hit those numbers. It's all self-motivated, and so Paul, which is why most people don't do shit. So Paul really put in the work then. Yeah, yeah bro. So yeah. within those eight months, I ended up getting like a, a few co uh, captain accommodations, you know, and it was just going after nice. these top 10, uh, you know, most wanted lists. And that would be my priority every single week when I was working patrol as, a, as you know, a rookie Show cop. Like a fugitive ops almost. You guys but, like uh, no, bro. I'm talking about when I was on patrol. Oh, okay. Like okay. I was, you know how you could be proactive or you could just go shack calls. Of course. You know yes, what I'm saying? Yes, and and yes. majority of time with, with the police out there, if you guys don't understand the culture in law enforcement, it's actually very toxic. And I'm not saying that, but morale is all time low. At the end of the day, um, we put in a tremendous amount of work out there and there's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of good people that put a lot of work, but it's not shown. I mean, we'll get into that in just a little bit with like, you know, social media and all that jazz. Yeah, sure. But with that being said, um, yeah, man, I just put in the work every week. You know, I was just like, man, this is a dream. Like, you know, I, by myself, I'm a cop. Like, I never knew this was going to happen. And ultimately, I would look for these cats. I would mm. do my own investigations while I was a beat cop. And ultimately, anybody that's looking to go into law enforcement right now or you're trying to aspire to be a detective, that's what you got to do. You got to put in the work and be not proactive. be scared. Yeah, get, you got to be proactive. proactive. You can't you can't move up in law enforcement just shagging calls. Mm. You know, there's a lot of slugs out there. And like you said, Mario, you hit it right in the point, bro. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not shy to say it. But at the end of the day, yeah, majority of the cops are going to be lazy. Yeah. It's just it's just the honest it's truth. True. And and the 10 percent, they're going to put in all the work. That's just the way it is. And usually those cops are the ones that go get promoted real quick. They're the leaders. They're the sergeants. They're SWAT. They're special unit. They, they go to a task force like I was in a task force. And then they get, you know, recognition. That's just what it is. You so know? how'd you guys meet uh, get them in and yourself? Oh, that's that's uh, that's a good story. So uh, I remember the night I, I worked a lot of overtime. So for people who don't know about my my basically work history, I'm a worker. That's just the way it is. You know, my mom, she was just like, hey, go to work. And I was just like, all right, cool. So I used to work 60 to 100 hour work weeks. I'm not even fluffing, bro. 60 to 100 hour work weeks in law enforcement. But I loved it. I love the adrenaline. Uh, I love taking these bad guys off the street. So all my overtime after working a 10 hour shift, I would probably go to my car, sleep for two hours, and then I would go hit. Uh, a certain part of town where um, they needed coverage for, for a beat cop. So then I was out there, but I was being proactive, you know? Mm. So um, I would do like, uh, you know, felony car stops. I would look for like the worst of the worst, like the shooters, the, the murderers, all the, all these guys. And Hey man, I was in the report writing room and I remember I had just got into the cable. I did a vehicle stop on these two cats. Uh, one had like a Glock so we did high risk. We got him out and then he had a rifle. And at that time he had like a bunch of narcotics, you know, heroin, coke and all that jazz. And then like the scale and everything it was actually hella funny because I was just like, why, why are you going to have everything here? Yeah. Like yeah, you're yeah. stupid. Dummy, yeah, you're stupid. stupid. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I yeah. like that. So, so then I'm in the report right room, bro. And, you know, it, I just hit like 19 hours and I'm like typing the report, you know, half asleep. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like, I'm man, I, I need some coffee. And then here comes this dude all high and tight. He's just like... Yup. Yup. I was just like, Hey bro, what, what you got there? And he comes in with like, uh, I guess the AK 47 that he got his, his, uh, arrest yeah. from. And he was just like, man, I just got this man off, off of the worst area, you know, in the city. And I was like, that's cool. He's like, what are you still doing here? And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, bro, you know, I got, I got a little thing right here. Got, got the rifle, got the gun. He's just like, oh, okay. Okay. So it was just like a mutual respect yeah, type yeah. of deal. Right. And you got the gun there so you could punch in the serial numbers and everything into the report. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. why, that's why you guys are probably wondering, why do they have the guns there? They have them so that they can put document it properly. 
serial numbers, etc. So, so Godin, was it like friendly competition or was it like, you know <laughs> it, what, respect, dog. I got you, man. It was for sure one of those things where we knew of each other, right? I was like, that Paul guy, okay, cool, right? I got this arrest. I got this murder suspect. I got this. Oh, he got that? Let me let me chase him too. So mm-hmm. it was it was mutual respect for sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and cool. and you were and you were in uniform patrol at the time, right? Yeah, I stayed in patrol and ended up being a sergeant. Okay. Nice. And, and for some of you guys that are wondering, a sergeant is essentially a first line supervisor who is, you know, managing like what, maybe eight to 10 patrolmen on a shift. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so what is one thing you would tell somebody that wants to be a cop? Like, for example, do's and don'ts, like off rip. Hey, I'm in school. I've also want to be a cop, but I don't know what it really entails. Like, what should they have in order to like be a good cop? And then I guess to avoid being a bad cop. No, absolutely. I mean, you could just your record got to stay clean. Mm-hmm. If you're uh, in California and you're smoking weed, stop smoking weed. Right. Yeah, stop. <laughs> yeah, stop smoking weed because it's really about the actual uh, time. So just because you're smoking weed right now, or let's say you did something like uh, I don't know, you got a speeding ticket or whatnot, because that counts against you in the process, mm. right? Um, you want to give it time before you go ahead and apply, because it's going to be people that come straight out of college. Some, I mean, in my academy, there was like doctors. There was uh, a couple cats that were lawyers. They already had families. They already had houses. They already made it in life, but they aspire to be cops. Yeah. That was just their thing. They wanted to do it. I even had a, a partner who got hired at Google. He was making three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and he was just like, "Man, you know, he's it's like, boring. I'm cool off Google." Yeah. yeah, that's exactly why he transferred to to police work because he's like, "Man, I just love police work." Yeah. And I was like, "That's a lot cool." Of people bro. hate the monotony of like a nine to five. Like they don't want to wake up, go to the office, sit there, whatever. They like the and I, that's honestly what I miss some the most about being an agent is that. Um, every day is different. One day you could be testifying, another day you could be in court, another day you could be, you know, talking to an informant, another day you could be hitting a house, you know, collecting evidence, whatever. So like you were able to, ch- every day was different, which made it really interesting. You know, no, no work days alike. So, but yeah. is it worth the risk though? If you not come home to your family, is it worth the risk? So here, here's the thing. And depends on the person. Yeah. It yeah. really depends on the person because everybody in law enforcement doesn't do it for money. Mm, That's facts. the thing. You're, you're yeah. not, you're not, you're not going to get rich. And I mean, I learned that the hard way because I was just like, man, I can suck my money. I can save, you know, I can invest. But even me working 60 to 100 hour work weeks, making close to 250 K a year as a cop, as a detective, just putting in the amount of hours that I did. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just drains you, bro. It's not sustainable. It's it, blood money. I don't think enough people uh, know that, that like, you know, as a law enforcement officer, you can definitely make six figures, whether it's fed or patrol or state or local. But a lot of the time is going to be blood money, like which means you're going to have to actually put those hours in to be able to make that kind of money. And then in California, they do get paid a lot more. But obviously, that's because the cost of living in California is outrageous and the taxes are high. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's an, it's an, it's insane right now, man. But yeah, just to wrap up the story, man. Yeah. So I met this. Uh, I met Getum, the guns. Yep. Yeah, met guns. We we're just all right, cool. And then after that, we just stayed in touch, man. But we were worked at separate ends of the department. Um, I went the detective route. He went more of the supervisor route. And then uh, once I got back from the narcotic task force, which is the next portion of basically of where I was transitioning from that street team, uh, I came back and then I worked on human trafficking, vice with like, you know, uh, pimps and prostitutes and all that jazz. Mm. Um, and then I did like domestic vi- domestic violence investigations. Um, I did uh, quite a bit, man. Those like are underrated. Those are some of the most dangerous calls is domestic violence. 100%. People, people yep. don't know that, that like, I think so, a couple of police officers were killed in uh, Bristol, Connecticut on a domestic violence call and, and people don't know. They think, oh, it's just some dudes fighting with a, some, you know, a couple fighting or whatever, but that's where it's the, the, the wildest, you know. Adrenaline, a lot of times. high energy. Yeah. Just, Yo, could you uh, imagine me, me being a Cop? It would never work. Right. <laughs> Imagine being on the job like all crime. Yeah, it's cool, man. He, he'd be the driver of the car. He'd be the owner. Hi, I got him. I got him on foot. He'd be the track star and shit. So, um, but yeah, the rest of violence calls are like people don't know. Those are some of the most dangerous um calls. Um. So, okay, so you end up joining uh, a task force. Can you tell the people what a task force is and what your specific duties were on that task force? Yeah, ultimately, I worked for an Akaris task force. Our main, uh, basically, uh, position or mission was ultimately to target large suppliers of narcotics. So, a.k.a. Cartel, yeah, um, that were facilitating our city as drop-off points, yeah, and that's what it was because there's yeah. major hubs in, in large metropolitan cities. So at the end of the day, that was a big issue uh, within our city. It was just crime-ridden, dope everywhere, and that was the leading cause for like shootings and murders and and you know just the way everything was. How far were you guys from the border? Like ten hours? <sighs> yeah, 
about 10 yeah. hours because I'm in San Diego right now, bro. So I'm, I'm, I'm close by. Yeah. 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 But back then, it, yeah, for, that was, uh, uh, yeah, San Diego's right there on mm-hmm. the border. So yeah. just you guys real quick, I'll tell you guys exactly how, like, this is the way how drug trafficking works in the United States typically. Most of the drugs come in from through Mexico, about 60% nowadays, right? It used to be Miami, but now it's Mexico. And it comes in through the Southwest border, guys, and it's typically smuggled in through customs. Once it's smuggled in through customs, whether it's through a vehicle or whatever it may be, um, and c- customs doesn't detect it, their job is to get to the first major city and start, you know, getting it to a rally point so that it can be distributed to different major cities in the United States through the interstate highway system, right? And um, w- w- major cities typically are hubs, just like you were describing, where, um, you know, they get a couple kilos, whatever it may be, and then that's distributed to, like, you know, lower level d- dealer. You got a main supplier in the area, and then he's distributing it out to the other guys that are going to actually have their own drug trafficking organizations that distribute the drugs. So you guys are basically getting it almost pretty close to the source because whoever you're targeting in a major city a lot of the times is fairly close to whoever the source is because they're the first ones to get it. By the time it hits like, you know, these rural areas or small little towns, it's probably been stepped on a few times. But when you get it in a major city like a drug hub, like a Houston or a Dallas or, you know, a San Antonio or, you know, in Atlanta, whatever it may be, at that point, you're going to be dealing with someone that's probably a kilogram, a level uh, distributor. But sorry, I just wanted to give the people that so they kind of know how it works. The drug game works. No, man, that's 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 good information, you know. Um, Yeah. So basically, we were just targeting the business the business minded individuals, the higher, like level, the guys high, the higher level guys that, that you would never suspect, bro. It could be like your grandpa. And you can you tell suspected. the people real quick who was on this task force so they kind of get an idea of like, you know, it was pretty serious. Yeah. Ultimately. Um, so from crime reduction team, I ended up going to as a, a single detective out of the 800 uh, officers in my department. And I got put like, basically just think of 21 jump street guys. All right. We're going to compare it to the movies. All right. Yeah. So 21 jump street, Sicario, uh, I was in UC capacity and I was working with Suplonis. So basically, that means he was an undercover guys. <laughs> UC capacity. <laughs> I was uh, a Suplonis. So, so basically informants. Uh-huh. Um, I, I, at any given time, I was handing in over 38 informants. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were rolling. We were hitting 38 informants. Yeah, 38 God, informants. Damn. Yeah, dude. Like, and I speak Spanish. Yeah. So that's that's the meat, the meat, uh, the meat and potatoes. Yeah, you can very say. Important. So there was only like about three of us that spoke Spanish, and since I spoke Spanish, that's why I got. Uh, admit it to the task force because uh, I remember there was probably like 15 detectives that had applied and I was the youngest one. So mm-hmm. a little bit over two years, they were like, why should we put you in this task force when everybody has done their time and every other agency? Because we had other 15 agencies. So we were dealing with uh, not only local PD, but the the head agency was the sheriffs and okay. and the sheriffs they would pick hand pick like the best of the best in the sheriffs for that county that we were protecting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then ultimately Alameda County. Yeah. yeah okay, Alameda yeah, County. Yeah. And they're, they're legit, bro. Yeah. Like, yeah no, no, for sure. Yeah. They're legit. So, um, with them, we would also do co cases with HSI, uh, DEA, FBI, Postal Service, all that jazz. Mm-hmm. So I met a lot of people, a lot so of networking. Task force, everybody was there. You had the feds, you had the state, you had the locals, you had the county, bro, everybody. We even had the military, bro. Oh, shit. Yeah. Like oh, Costa, you guys Costa have a uh, counter drug, National Guard, probably. Yes, yeah, yes. We, had, we, yeah. we had them. So they'll, they're set up like, uh, they would set up like a perimeter. Basically do like the admin stuff for us. Yeah. Pack the evidence and all that jazz. Yeah. But ultimately, when we would go, you know, hit the door, uh, do the raids or whatnot, then ultimately they would go and secure everything for us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got into this unit. I mean, I still remember my first day, man. And I was telling Fresh this, and uh, I, I, that's why I asked you. I was just like, "Hey, man, you ever seen Narco Sicario?" Because it's like super similar. Yeah. But ultimately, first day, um, I remember I going to the briefing, six a.m. You got over a hundred people. Uh, the lieutenant that hired me, days. they're like, "Hey, this is our new guy, Paul." And I'm like, "What up?" <laughs> and then they're all looking at me like, "Who the fuck is this guy?" Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, sizing me up and down. And I was like, yeah, I'm from so and so department. They're like, oh, you guys are weak. That's yeah. just the, that's just the the way it is. It's yeah. very competitive. Yeah. Um. So at the end of the day, I went in there, but I'll, I'm very confident. That's yeah. just I'm confident in my abilities. So yeah. if somebody said I can't do it, guess what? I'm gonna prove you wrong. You can do it. Yeah. yeah, I could do it. And that's the first mindset that comes into anything you want in life, entrepreneurship, absolutely everything. Because there's always gonna be haters waiting for you to fail. Facts. Okay. And your haters are gonna be the number one to actually watch you the most, especially online. How old were you when the, when you gave this briefing? Whew, I was 27, 28. Yo, so real quick for the audience, because I, I got it this year, you're not doing it. I gotta, I, got the, I gotta let the people know exactly what it was like. So imagine being 27 years old, you walk into a briefing, right? There's a hundred law enforcement officers there. They're all tacked out with vests and shit like that. They got their guns hanging, different agencies. You got feds there, you got state and locals there, et cetera. You're a new guy, you just became a detective. 
and you're going ahead and you're giving a briefing, guys. OK, not when you give the briefing or you're the, the, the case agent or the case officer in this case or case detective, you're basically telling them, hey, this is what the mission is for today. These are the targets. These are the informants. You're going through an operation plan. You're basically running the entire briefing and everyone's you know safety honestly depends on what the hell you're telling them. So it's nerve wracking to be there in front of 100 plus people from different agencies, some guys uniform, some guys in plain clothes, et cetera. So you got to be extremely sure of yourself when your tonality, the way you speak, your cadence, et cetera, because if you go in there like uh, uh, the target, well, I think he does. They're going to be like, what the fuck? No, we're not going to go. We're, you're expecting us to go out there and do surveillance on some gangbangers and put ourselves in a you know precarious situation life wise. And you don't even know what the fuck's going on. A lot of you guys ask me, Myron, how are you good with public speaking? It's because I've done hundreds of briefings like that where. It's literally life or death, guys. You got to go up there fucking sure of yourself. This is the informant. This is what he looks like. He's a friendly, etc. This is the target. This is criminal history. This is what he does, etc. Okay. Then they're going to ask questions. Yo, uh, what about this and that? You got to be ready for contingencies. Okay. If the source doesn't do this or if the bad guy doesn't show up, or this is the second rallying point, etc. You got to have all this stuff in place, guys. So for you to be doing that at 27 years old with 100 people plus, it's nerve wracking, guys. And a lot of you guys will never, ever experience it, but it's extremely uh scary <laughs> bro and like a break now and and i'm gonna I'm, gonna I'm gonna hit a point exactly what you just said mm -hmm. you have to be confident yeah and i'm seriously. gonna tell you right this my first few briefings in front of you know all these people that have had 15 20 years on mind you guys i only had about like two years two and a half years yeah. i'm basically still considered a rookie yeah that's They're why like, i have to do it justice for you man because like they don't know what you're talking about like like it is scary you exactly know I mean? yeah. exactly so at that time man i mean like i've always been raised like introverted you know now i mean of course i got my own business i got you know i did, did what money. i did making money <laughs> and uh ultimately how to come out of the shell extrovert right you have to lead by example and that's just the way i run things now but at the end of the day the first couple of briefings i was like that just just exactly how you described it bro i was like i was like stuttering yeah. i was just like uh, uh and you could tell fresh you could tell because these these guys they're like humongous freaking swat guys feds DEAs, guys that have done hundreds and hundreds of cases and they're ready they're ready to take down the worst of the worst. And I'm over here like, ah, uh, like, but you learn. Yeah. You yeah. learn from experience. You have to fail in order to get success. You get better. And ultimately, that's what I did. I surrounded myself with the best narcotics detective in the in the actual unit because mm -hmm. there was 15 detectives. And he took me under his wing. And nice. I'll never forget this, man. It was almost like training day. He was just like, so you're the new buck, huh? <laughs> and he's just like, well, you about to learn some, uh, some shit today, boy. Yeah. They threw me the keys to their SWAT tank, okay? Mind you guys, if you guys ever watch Dope on Netflix or, or Drugs Inc., you know, uh, Narcotics Task Force, any type of task force, um, U.S. Marshals, all that jazz, these guys, they go in gear. They're ready yeah. for war. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I mean, they're, they're right because you're dealing with some real evil people that have AKs that really kill you. You know, they don't want to go to jail for 30, 40, 50 years or life, right? So at the end of the day, they had me go and drive a tank during this operation into the living room of this house on my first day like from from the briefing to doing that and i remember the lieutenant he was a cowboy if you guys watch drugs inc oakland you'll you'll see who i'm talking about this dude used to have a pair of his lucky cowboy boots and and put them on with his swat outfit and be like get some throw flash bags i was like oh, man i don't even gotta hit it bro like yeah. he's like when Ooh. you're doing shit like that then you know that bro. it's a high risk warrant i mean did they like pull the front door out or did you guys like literally just run it right into the hall into the trap house we run into the trap house bro oh, it, it was like a it's almost like the triads, man, because it was like multiple grow houses. So it was like 20, 25 grow houses mm. and they were barricaded, bro. We're talking okay. about, yeah, yeah. Uh, they had assault rifles. They had all types of shit, hella money, millions of dollars in suitcases and storage rooms. Crazy wow. shit. That's what I'm saying. You got to watch the cardio, bro. You'll, you'll, you'll like it fresh. Yeah. So, yeah. So that happens. And then after that, my life completely changed. I'm like, man, it's like a movie. Like I go, I go to dinner with my parents and they don't know what the hell, you know, I just went through. Yeah. Like I went through some crazy ass shit. My mom was like, so how's work? How's the new, how's the new <laughs> unit? I'm like, it's <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's cool. You know, like I got, I got a good mentor, you know, he's teaching me the ways. So my, so my mentor in that specific task force, he was outgoing, you know, he, he at the time he was headed up like me. So a Hispanic and yeah. he just knew how to work yeah. the informants, bro. He was just like mamos net that way like da, da, yeah. da, da. he spoke spanish like yeah, yeah. fluently right and uh bueno. you know, exactly that type of shit. yeah yeah Vete Vamos la verga. like yeah. all that shit right yep. so the informants they respected him yeah because they build that foundation 
yep. they build a foundation with with that detective and he was just like bro you gotta talk like me yeah. duplicate what i'm doing exactly for the next 90 days and you're gonna be successful yeah. and i'm a young buck like me i'm just like a sponge i'm just like all right cool so i go over there and i'm like all right so this is how you talk i'm trying to i'm trying to learn how, like the way he controls these informants and then i start learning and learning and then after my first year i won detective of the year I want a bunch of accommodations. I was the only detective in that unit where they offered to actually pick, hand pick any officer in my department as a partner. Bam. Mm. Yeah. That's, so I that's, was. That's a big deal, bro. It was it was huge. But, Man, I offered it. I offered it again. I was just like, nah, I can't do it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, patrols another world for investigation. So I could see, you know, <laughs> but, why? But, but there's a key there. He found the best detective yeah. in the spot. Yeah. Went under his wing. And took heed and listened to him. Yeah, that's important in life. You find a mentor you love, that you want to respect and be like, follow his lead, and over time you become a better version of yourself. So that's yeah. important, man. And and yeah. I think uh, also just so the audience kind of knows, like informants are the lifeblood of doing investigations. Like if you don't have informants, you're not working. So you need to be able to not only have informants but have them trust you to give you the best and most actionable intelligence. You know, and a lot of the times, sometimes these informants will work for different agencies. If you want to get the best info, or get the info first. They got to trust, like, and respect you. And a lot of times that comes from speaking the same language, looking like them, speaking like them, etc. Um, and, and that's what it comes down to. I mean, some of the, uh, when I was on task force, et cetera, so the state and locals were imperative because they knew their informants. They sometimes even grew up with these individuals, whatever. So they liked and trusted them. So they would give them information. And if those guys, you know, had a good relationship with them, were you able to do really good cases because these informants would put you in certain situations to allow you to, you know, seize dope, seize guns, whatever it may be. So, oh yeah, no, yeah. You, you, you hit it on the point, bro, because man, I even had some informants that were like, I'm not going to, I'm going to make you a captain. Yeah. But like they knew. They knew it was incentivized for them to provide that information and whatnot. And some of them were working their cases off. And I mean, I get it. They got to yeah. do what they got to do. At the end of the day, you know, uh, I, I came from si very similar environments that they came, low income family. Uh, yeah. They were just doing uh, what they were doing. I mean, illegally, right? Uh, but to provide for their family. And at the end of the day, I mean, I was just doing what I had to do as a detective. I was just like, hey, man, no hard feelings against you. But at the end of the day, this is what I got to do. And I could give you your options, right? So that's why I was able to build yeah. rapport. When I said, you know, I was working around like 34, 38 informants at the time, uh, it's because I was able to go and articulate myself. I was able to go and relate to them, be yeah. like, yeah, I come from the same background. I'm Mexican. You know, I spoke to them in Spanish. You know, mm. we'd meet up and I'd probably be eating like a taco or something. Yeah. I'd be like, hey, you want a taco? And yeah. they'd be like, man, you cool. They prefer that over some white dude with a crew cut. I Let's mean, just, just, Let's just keep it all the way, 1,000. You know, that's the truth, guys. Well, well, you hey, know. Let's just keep it real. You know. At the end of the day, the top performers in this task force were all Hispanic. Yep. So yeah. at the end of the day, that's just, it is what it's it is. Close. Even I mean, with networking, people like people like them. For example, you can't go to Romania and be different. You got to do the customs. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you're like them and you show them that your lifestyle is pretty similar, yep. you know what? He's one of us. I rock with you. Yeah. Even when it comes to like, you know, things behind the scenes that I tell you, it's like, yeah. people trust me because I look like them. Yeah. So they tell me things that I wouldn't normally tell other people. Yep. So, for sure. Up. You got some chat here? Um, yeah. And real quick, yo, let's go ahead and kill the Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter stream, guys. Come on over to YouTube uh, if you guys want to watch the rest of the show, by the way. I know, I know you guys are enjoying this conversation right here. I know you guys <laughs> would like it. So come on over. Fresh and fit on YouTube, guys. Um, if you're on Facebook, you're on Twitch, or you're on uh, Twitter. Um, and I'll read these chats real quick, and then we'll go into uh, the transition into entrepreneurship. Um, unless you have any other war stories you want to tell the people. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, okay. So it, this bring back, it brings back good memories, man. Uh, 10 bucks uh, from MIR goes... Uh, 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 hold on. Uh, what was that? Read it first. Uh, okay, we'll just skip it. All right. Fresh found the homeless man and gave him a donation that changed the man's life. Myron blue pilled himself and got stuck with Destiny's wife. What? Okay, whatever. <laughs> okay. Uh, Outlaw Transport goes, I'm an owner... Uh, op trucker, Myron, I'm in Laredo right now. Dog, this place seems twice as busy as it was last year. Traffic is insane. Was at the Target on San Dario and got, uh, not going to lie, there was some baddies. Yeah, man, I mean, Laredo is uh, the, um, one of the fastest growing cities in the U.S. consistently, guys, and it has the biggest truck port in the country. Uh, Zedan, two bucks goes 15K to one mil. Love from Dearborn, Michigan. Okay, shout out to you, Almost my there, friend. man. Uh, Valor Chris goes, shout out to FNF fan. Back for another Money Monday. Keep up the good work, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Roberto Moreno goes, bring on Cameron, Devin Crew. He's honest about gold diggers. I DM'd you, Chris, and with his name, please. Uh, I don't know about that, bro. Um, we got like the video, you ninja watchers, all right? And then Bob Ross goes, I've been asking every day for three months, begging you guys to invite Base Zeus and Darius M on the show. They both said they'd love to be on the podcast. Uh, Darius M, I've reached out to him. I, I didn't hear anything back, so let him know. Um, Etienne Salvin, what's up, FNF? Thanks for doing what you do. Been in the gym for the last six months. Join Tate's HU to get my money right. 
wasn't happy being mediocre. Yes, guys, you got to strive for more. Fresh Myron, do you guys have any tips to nail a job interview? Um, you got to go in there with confidence, man. There's a book. Uh, it's a small booklet. It's called How to Do an Interview. If you read that book, online or offline, that will help you get any job you want. It's a very good book. Okay. It's a blue book, by the way. It's a blue book. Yeah. Uh, flying into Miami this weekend from PA for my 30th. What are the chances I could even just tap in with you guys? Big fan. Oh, man. we th- This week is going to be hectic, bro. I mean, uh, if you see me outside, but uh, yeah. Uh, what's up? Good. FN- uh, what's good? FNF wanted to give a shout out to my boys, Paul, Tony, and Gadam. Keep uh, beasting. And only way to go is up. Let's go. Shout out to you, Shady. Cool. Uh, Michael Trostein, $1. Thank you. Let's go. This is going to be uh, fire. fire. And that's from Faik uh, Ashi. We almost at one mil. Hopefully by then, Fresh can talk normally. Mo can stop being obese. Chris forehead will shrink and Myron's hair will return. And that's from Zidane. Thank you for shitting on all of us. That's funny. <laughs> Fresh to BBC goes, y'all boys cap and stop acting like you wouldn't clap them cheeks. If you had the chance, you know you all would. Remember, chat focus on the assets. Forget the face and focus on the assets. Tell him, big homie. <laughs> the hell he talking about? Oh, the girl I took to Halloween Horror Nights. <laughs> oh, okay. Who, who was it? Uh, a uh, famous uh, OnlyFans girl. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> but it, it was it was funny because, like, that's not my, my typical type of girl, you know? It was just funny, bro. Oh, is it what you showed me before? Yeah. <laughs> 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 that girl looked like she's uh, in a fucking funny mirror. All right. Major shout out to Sergeant Goddamn. <laughs> uh, 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 get him, uh, Gabriel Michael. He's the goat of the Bay Area. Shout okay, out. Hey, man. Look at that, bro. man. They know you. are notorious. <laughs> and then uh, Hood Ninja Fresh goes, I turned 21 today and I just wanted to say thanks to my parents <laughs> and you guys at Fresh and Fit. I'm far ahead of people my own age because the things two goats teach, I really appreciate you guys and it will never go unnoticed. I love you guys. Pause. Hey, man. Yo, we got you. Never forget, Marco, we flew him out Marco, here and uh-huh. we showed him a good time. He got in the Lambo truck, had a great time. Shout out to Hood Ninja Fresh because you're a real one. Now you see what's possible. Yeah. How do I deal with tenants that don't pay on time? Just to get ready to evict them, bro. That's what I do with my tenants that don't pay. <laughs> Fuck that shit. I'm living life uh, in the Discord. Best community. I helped not uh, Nick lose his V card. LOL from the servers made a Tinder for him. Okay, cool. Chubb Wilson. Shout out to Chubbs. Uh, and then we got two bucks, 500 super chats, pause until uh, December. It's my uh, sad face. Okay, Mike. YouTube took down my video pod for misinformation. Okay, sorry to hear that. Damn. Does proactive mean profiling? Um, not necessarily, my friend. Vake Ashley goes, these guys are the real deal. They're changing lives every day. And then the last two here, John A, is the top G ever coming back? Yes, he will be next year. And then uh, Ace, five bucks, goes, um, fresh about to take fetal position, cold showers for weeks after this bromance ends. Myron found his soulmate. I'm just clowning great guests. Okay, you guys, fucking guys, bro. Uh, so, so you're on the task force. Um, you're making arrests. You're doing, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, cool things. So, when did you start the side hustle? All right. So there was one case, uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to bore you guys with stories because I got hundreds of stories. But hey, man, you could tell the story. Go ahead, bro. There was one case where I was case agent, uh-huh. and uh, we were actually tracking down this uh, narcotic trafficker from uh, SoCal. Okay. okay. And we had hit him up one time, and I still got info on him uh, at that time. And uh, we ended up getting a few mil off of the house that he was at, but we didn't we didn't recover any dope, mm. right? There was just like a lot of- You perf- just got proceeds. Yeah, okay. basically. Paraphernalia. You know, it's all cash. So yeah. at the end of the day, it's just like, where uh-huh. did it come from? This guy doesn't have a job probably more than likely. <laughs> exactly, like, yeah. bro. We got yeah. like like five cars. Yeah. You know, we don't catch the smart ones. Yeah, of course. So at the end of the day, we do that. He, he automatically comes out of jail. I still got info on him. So a week later, we track him down to a hotel. Mm-hmm. And we track him down to a hotel. And uh, we're UC capacity. So uh, we're checking it out. We see a couple people coming out of that room. And we do a couple of uh, stops on these on these cu- clients, these customers. Okay, on- identify them, etc. Yeah. With traffic stops. Yep. Okay. So, so just for the audience, real quick, just so y'all know what the hell's going on here, so this you understand the full breadth of the story. Basically, they're watching a the guy. They see people coming in and out of his hotel room. So what they're doing is, as those people are coming out, they're doing traffic stops to just to identify them, figure out who the hell they are, to be able to draw links, and then they're working in an undercover capacity, which means they don't, they're wearing plain clothes. No one knows what they're what they're necessarily doing. So that's kind of the, the idea of the operation here. Yeah, I like the breakdown, bro. Yeah, just because <laughs> they're not going to understand the jargon. So I'm like, oh, shit, we, I got to. So now you guys know exactly what they're doing. So they're identifying people with, just, with traffic stops that leave the room, which is smart. That's how you build the the web of the organization. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I, I wasn't at your level, though, with T3s and all that jazz, ah. man. So, you know what I'm saying? Oh, they're doing actual narco shit. Yeah. No, I wasn't, I wasn't there yet. Yeah, man. But you guys are still doing the good work, though, so. It, it, it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. But um, no, so. To, to, to get into the story, basically dude was in the room. He had like probably like four or five bricks of coke. 
Um, dude had just sold like about a couple keys of heroin, um, black tar, the Mexican mm, shit, the worst shit, yeah, the worst shit. Yep. And um, hey, we wait, stopped cause, because it's black. Black tar. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, slide. <laughs> That's yeah, the good. most dangerous. And then also for you guys in there saying like, oh, illegal traffic stops. No, man, they find probable cause to stop the vehicle. So let's say they don't do a lane switch. Let's say they don't turn their blinkers on, etc. It's extremely easy to stop a vehicle for some type of traffic infraction. And that's the guys that they stopped the vehicle under to identify the suspect, the person, because they're like, hey, I pulled you over because you didn't lane switch. Completely legal. They take their driver's license, figure out who they are, etc. Give it back. You have a nice day. Here's just a warning. Bam. Damn. So Done. a lot of times it's not listed like random. It might be because they followed you from a surveillance. Yes. Damn. Yeah. So it could be where like you know they're just simply identifying you and they're stopping you with actual real probable cause, but it's under the ruse that it's a traffic stop, but they did it 100% legally. And that's very important, guys, yeah. from a prosecution standpoint, that's because huge. let's say they stop you, right? And they stop you for some bullshit. They don't develop their own probable cause, and then they find 10 kilos of coke in the car. Yep. Well, guess what? They can't prosecute you now because the stop wasn't good. Yep. And since the stop wasn't good, fruit of a poisonous tree, it all gets thrown out, and you don't, you can't get prosecuted. So they have to make sure that the stop is good, even if it's just for a simple identification. Yep. Mm. No, you, you broke it down just like a lawyer, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had these so. arguments with AUSAs, man, a million times. So it's like it's like burned in my brain. Like, yo, you got to develop your own PC when you stop them. You got to you can't use our information telling you there's drugs in there. And, and so. I, I, don't, I remember when I was uh, working with the feds, man, that like ultimately you guys would have to articulate like the sky. You'd be like, the sky was blue. Yeah. And at this day, I had like a, a like a sweat coming down my head as I was watching <laughs> the guy sell him a brick of a square <laughs> Coke. And it was uh, snow white. And you yeah. know you have to articulate the federal shit. prosecutors yeah. are divas, bro. It is crazy. I, like they're they're so much harder to work with than like state prosecutors. Like yeah. federal prosecutors, like oh I don't this case isn't sexy enough or you need more facts. <laughs> blah, blah. And so it's like they're, they're they're such divas and they can decline cases. They're not like ADAs, well, where ADAs yeah. like typically have to take the case. Yeah. The feds don't. They go I don't want this. Give it to the state. So they're fucking you know crybaby. So you got to be really on point with everything with them. Yeah. But sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. So you guys no, are doing this good. operation, identifying yep. people coming in and out of the room. Yep. Black so tar. <laughs> black tar heroin so we end up stopping two clients that had just purchased uh some more money uh the dope and we had enough pc basically to get inside that room so then um we probable get cause yep we got the probable cause mm. and uh, we get the search warrant and ultimately uh we hit the room okay and when i say we hit the room we actually you know we put our gear on and if you guys saw Fast and Furious, basically what Paul Walker was doing, you know, he's undercover and as a racer, and then he goes uh, raid mode, right? Got all his gear. You guys in the got back that one quick then. Yeah. Oh, we got we got it quick, bro. Yeah. And nowadays it's all electronic. Yeah. So you don't got to go and do the paper copy. Go yeah, yeah, go yeah. court side with the judges yeah. over there watching the game and whatnot, and just yeah. have a sign. No, it's you're all swearing to it in the car, probably. Like call the judge. Hey, this is the whatever yeah, it, it, Facetime. Now it's like Facetime. Yep. You know. Yep. So um, we end up doing that. Uh, we get the search warrant. All right, we're good to go. We go, we brief an uh, operations plan, basically like, you know, contingencies, uh, safety and all this. We'll be like, hey, we know this guy. He could be armed. Uh, he's a he's a, a gangbanger and all that shit. And ultimately, when we go and breach the room, when I say breach, we hit the door. Um, I was the second person in the stack. So oh, when shit. I say the stack is ultimately is when the officers, they line up before they make entry into the room. And ultimately um, my boy was in first because he was a, what do you would call a, uh, a patrol rifle officer? He like, he was, he was uh, qualified for that. So you have to qualify in California with certain agencies in order to shoot a rifle. Because yes. if you shoot somebody and you're not qualified with that, you could get sued. That like, could take everything. Damn. So you have to qualify and you have to keep doing in that every quarter so because he he had the rifle i was like all right cool yeah you're gonna go first i'll go second so as we're breaching the door the dude the was two doing, most dangerous spots by the way guys the, the first two guys almost if there's gonna be a shooting they get hit first yeah straight up so you gotta mentally you just gotta be prepared and when i was in law enforcement it was just like i'm coming home no matter what yeah i'm coming home no matter what i don't mm. care who i'm going against i'm mm. taking you so at the end of the day, uh, we go in the door and the crook, he ended up actually doing powdered heroin. So mm. he was doing powdered heroin and it was mixed with fentanyl. Oh, sure. At this time, fentanyl was huge, especially in the streets of the city that we were protecting. And ultimately his body was used to it. So he was able to do it. Right. But for us, it wasn't because we don't we don't do drugs. So it went in the air, bro. Oh, fuck. And it hit the entire team. Like it got airborne. Oh shit! Oh and, shit! Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you don't know, fentanyl, a grain of salt, 
A grain of salt will kill you. It will be absorbed in your skin. You don't even got to sniff it or anything. And ultimately, you could die. You could overdose, even if you've never used drugs or anything like that. And that's why they came out with, with the actual uh, antidote, yeah. you know, Narcan. You know, all my medical professionals, my sisters are probably like, hey, you're talking about Narcan. But yeah, ultimately, uh, they had just trained us up on Narcan. Mm. No one had it on their person. Nobody yeah. was carrying it's it on new. their vest. It's brand yeah. new. So what ends up happening? Everybody left it in the car. Uh. <laughs> so then my boy, I remember like, you know, we recovered the coke, we arrest the dude, and then dude's talking shit. And, you know, I'm over here just putting him on the, on the, on the ground, whatever. And then my boy's like, hey, bro, I don't feel good. And I was just like, what's wrong with you? Because everybody was dizzy. Yeah. You know, we didn't know we just got hit with fentanyl, yeah. airborne fentanyl. And he's just like, I don't feel good. I'm not shitting you guys for anybody that's watching this right now. The dude turned blue within three seconds. He turned blue within three seconds. His hands turned through three seconds. I got a chair. He sat down. He's like, I don't feel good, bro. Profusely sweating. It was like a fucking movie, dude. Yeah. The sergeant ran upstairs. He's like, what's going on? And the, the officer, he literally looked like a dead corpse. Like within another three seconds. Like, like some Resident Evil shit, bro. Like when people transform. Like he was like, and literally, like he looked dead. And I was like, get the Narcan, get the Narcan. I had just went to Quantico, bro. Uh, okay. I had yeah. just got training on this shit. So I went out there to Quantico for two weeks. And luckily, I, you know, I, I just had Did it fresh in my mind. Did you go to the DEA Academy or the FBI yeah, Academy? Yeah, I went to the, the DEA, DEA Academy. Academy. Yeah. You Man, saved them? Huh? You saved them? Bro, it was a team effort. I'm not going to say that I was the one that administrated it, but I was the one, because you need to be clear-headed in these situations. So I was just like, hey, and I was the case agent. So at the end of the day, I was just like, hey, go get the Narcan now. And then uh, the other detectives got the Narcan. We had to hit that guy four or five times, like through his nostrils, bro. And then he like, <gasps> he got up. The sergeant came, he's like, what happened? We we're like, dude, I don't know. He overdosed on fentanyl, I think. The sergeant passed out because it was just so, uh, it was like a high intensity, fast paced, dramatic scene, man. Yeah. And you know, the dude, he was already like about to retire and shit in yeah. the next couple of years and he passed out. Yep. I was like, fuck, dude, I hope this dude's not dead too. So at the end of the day, they rush him to uh, the ambulance. You know, we put our little hazmat suits that we learned in a DA academy yep. and we go do our thing. We clean up the room. We recover the evidence. We take the dude uh, to jail. He gets, you know, 10, 15 years, whatever. When did this happen? This was how many years ago? Shit, dude. This was like Four 2017, to that, 2018. Because yeah. I was going to tell the audience, like, yeah. like um, fentanyl guys back then, like, was kind of like a new phenomenon. <laughs> like, it was like a number one federal mandate to go after. And it was still new on the street. So a lot of people didn't really know how to yeah. deal with it. And they were just starting to send people over to the DEA Academy in Quantico yeah. to train them up on how to deal with it. So thank God you went to that training because um, had you not, like, who knows if those guys would have been able to get um, that Narcan, adm Narcan administered on them so quickly. But yeah, like guys, this was like a new thing back then. So, the, you know, obviously some people were, and the thing with, with, with fentanyl is like some people, like it doesn't affect them at all. Other people, it fucks them up. Yeah. So it depends on the individual. So it, it, it didn't hit you then? No, it hit me. I was just dizzy, bro. So it might have been at that time that my body just resisted it. Like my my actual resistance, just just like COVID, right? COVID, it hits certain people and then yeah. some people, you know, go to the hospital. Other yeah. people, it's just like, oh, I feel a little sick, but I'm okay. Yeah. But ultimately, both people have, you know, the symptoms or whatnot. Some people respond a little bit better yeah. than others. Exactly. So it's a little bit different. But I, I was just lightheaded, you know, whatever. And then ultimately, I was just focused on taking care of business. Because yeah, that's man. all I did, man. Uh, with everything I do in life, even right now, being a CEO of a multi-million dollar company, I just focus. I focus. I simplify things. And to me, simplicity equals success. Yeah. So at the end of the day, dude, uh, that's what I tell everybody. Just focus on the main mission. And the main mission was to make sure everybody goes home and then to recover the dope and to take the dude to jail. And that was it. We handle business. So then. I remember this night, uh, at the time I had just broke up with my, my ex, I think it's uh, seven years. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had just moved, I had bought my, my first, uh, like five bedroom house. It was a fat ass house. And you know, I was, I was on top of the world, dude. And ultimately I go to this house. I was there alone. And I remember the chief calls me mm -hmm. and oh, the, the chief, chief. Oh, shit. She, she, the, yeah. 800 officers. Number one bro. guy. Yeah. A number one woman at the time. Oh, it was a chief. Yeah. Oh, she was cool. Yeah. She was cool. All right. Um, but she calls me and she's like, Hey, I heard what happened. The mm -hmm. sheriff personally called me and heard what, what happened, um, with you guys. And, uh, I was like, Oh, thanks chief. Th thanks for calling in. But I was just like, to, anything you need. I was just like, nah, I'm okay. You should take a week off. I was like, no, I got to work overtime tomorrow. And that's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. Like, 
you you hold everything in, bro, and you don't know what you go through, like in a mental state, like uh, mental health is really not looked at in law enforcement. It re it's really not. Yeah, yeah. This is really not. Um, and that's something that, you know, I wish they would go ahead and actually focus on in departments because they got to they got to help all these officers, man. They go through dramatic shit like I went through. And this is this is only like the, the peak of the mountain, bro. Yeah. Like I said, I got 100 stories. But at the end of the day, you know, I sucked it in. You know, I was able to go ahead and get help for that. And then ultimately, hey, man, flourish. Everything that uh, neg negative in my life that I go through, I use it as fuel yeah. to become successful. Same. And at the end of the day, yeah, all the haters, everything I've gone through my life, dude, people talking shit, people downing me. I use that as fuel because I'm like, all right, it's all good, bro. That's why you're fucking still at your nine to five or that's why you're fucking you ain't about shit. And I'm doing this. Yeah. You know, I'm living yeah. life. You know, and you don't start living until you go into financial freedom, which I'm going to get into in just a couple minutes. But ultimately, that was the situation that dramatically changed the way I viewed on what I was doing with law enforcement. Mm. So that week, I took a lot of time to uh, think. And I was just like, man, you know, if you only have one source of income, mm -hmm. you're one step away from poverty. Facts. It's real. One is none. One is Two none. Is one. one is none. Exactly. It's almost like when you make your first meal, right? You don't really make your first meal because mm -hmm. you got to pay taxes, taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially in Cali. <laughs> yeah. They hit you. Yeah. So with that being said, man, like ultimately I look for a side hustle mm -hmm. and I had a couple of friends. I've always been an entrepreneur for the past decade. I was even a nightclub promoter when I was 18 to 24, bro. That's how I actually met uh, one of the sergeants for the PD that ah. I applied for. He was just like, you want to be a cop? And yeah. I was just like, yeah. He's just like, bro, you used to throw those crazy ass parties with thousands of people and shit. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, well, yeah, you know, I'm growing up. So <clears throat> I went and I started talking to a few friends that are successful entrepreneurs and ultimately, you know, through network. That's why I'm a, I'm a big believer in network is your net worth. Yeah. And it's humongous. You know, one thing I was telling Getum right before when we were checking in uh, to, to your guys' building is like, what's the fastest way? And I'm going to ask each one of you guys, I want to I hear your guys' opinion on this. What's the fastest way you can become a millionaire? If you could give one advice to the, the crowd watching right now. Leveraging your skill and then being able to, uh, you know, um, scale it. But you're going to be able to only leverage that skill and scale it with a team. That's a great answer. Yeah. How about you, Fresh? I would say network, man. Like, I, I may not know everything myself, but like, the people on my team know everything. Yeah. And my skill could add to that and we all be successful. Yeah. And that's huge, bro. I, you know, it's the same thing network. Yeah. You, you want to be a millionaire, guys, for, for everybody that's watching right now, you got to go and either do one or two things. You either got to pay for that millionaire's time or multimillionaire or whoever you want to be at their level. Or you got to provide value. Mm -hmm. Nothing in life is free, mm -hmm. you know, because we talk to thousands. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs online or wannapreneurs, like I call it. <laughs> and, that ain't, and, and that ain't talking shit. It's just reality. Yeah. You know, people that are like, I do YouTube. I do this. I do that. I do that. I was like, when do you have time to do all this shit? Mm -hmm. You know, and then they're like, well, I'm also trying to uh, use your service. And I'm like, you're not going to have time. Like, I'm just keeping it real with you. They're yeah. like, but I got, I got the money to pay for your program. Sorry, no, because yeah. I know you're not going to complete it. And at the end of the day, I don't want to provide a service to somebody who is not going to be successful. That does nothing for me, Facts. my marketing or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. That's why we have a high success rate, mm -hmm. you know? But all right, to go back to that, I uh, met somebody who was in the ATM game, basically automated teller machines, uh, those little machines that you guys see at gas stations and all that. And uh, ultimately, it's not the sexiest business. Let's keep it real. Let's yeah. keep it real. ATMs like what? Yeah. So ultimately met this dude, super successful. He had a huge network uh, within investment groups for a lot of restaurants, bars, nightclubs, uh, dispensaries at 2007. That's when they were 2017. That's when they started transitioning, making it legalized in California or whatnot. Right. Yeah. Uh, charging the shit out of people. I think 30 yeah. percent. Uh, if they wanted the license. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You want a dispensary yeah. license. Yeah. We're going to tax you. Yeah. yeah. Big it was, time. It's crazy, bro. Yep. So then um, ultimately. We, uh, I started talking. I was just like, damn. So he planted the seed in my head and I'm like, so you can buy your own ATM from the manufacturer as an ATM, uh, independent deployer, and then go ahead and actually just find your location. And like who, who provides the money? He's like you. And I was just like, 
how much money do I put in there? And he's just like, dude, just start off with like two to three grand, you know? And at that time I had about 10 K saved up. Right. Mm -hmm. But I also had decent credit. So what I ended up doing is I ended up leveraging my credit. And this is a mm. little gem for everybody that's watching right now is if you have over a 700 credit score right now, I would suggest go with like American express blue cash credit card. You get to leverage that 12 to 15 months of zero interest and you also go ahead and you get $250 cash back. I ended up going ahead and buying my actual first six ATMs off of a credit card. Mm. And then I leveraged the, the money in my savings and I put it on all my ATMs. I put about two grand on each ATM. Mm. So that's how I started my ATM business. That was my tangible business. So I basically went from those first six to 30 ATMs within 18 months. And this is still while I was still working as a detective, yep. still pulling in 60 to hundred hour work weeks, because at the end of the day, people always ask me, people are like, um, well, you come from a rich family. Oh, oh, your daddy's money. Oh, oh, this, the other <laughs> one, I bought the Porsche Panamera. Yeah. I had a they command that you were rich or some shit like no, that. No, bro. Yeah. Uh, uh, I remember a commander yeah. was saying that, oh, that must be the fucking drug money off the task force. Oh my so I was God. like, be hey, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Because that type of shit will get you like, uh, and uh, like, uh, in I, trouble. Yeah. Yeah. It'll get internal you, affairs. Yeah. yeah, yeah internal yeah. affairs. But that's assume that bullshit. But they didn't know, did they know you had a side hustle at this point? Probably not. No, because right? I keep it low key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, that's, I'm they not be the, hating. Yeah. At the end of the day, I'm not the type of person to go over there and be like, man, I'm doing this shit. You know, look at me, look at me. Nah, dude, like, I'm low key, man. Yeah. You know? So, I started that and I was actually matching how much I was making at the department. So I was just like, man, how after 18 I... months only yeah. of doing this side hustle. And the beauty is that you were kind of like set and forget it. You buy the ATM, put the money in it done. Right. You just oh. put in your location and it was a beautiful thing. So when you go ahead and you actually start this business on your own and let's say you don't have the help, all you got to do is prospect and market yourself. And that's it. That's ultimately what I did. I had the sales experience before I was in law enforcement. So I was able to go into these locations and actually articulate my offer, provide value. Yeah. You know, majority of the time people are like, well, it's hard to find locations. It's hard to do this and that. No, it's not hard. You're not even trying. You're already setting yourself for failure, having that negative mindset and being a victim. Yeah. You know, I just launched TikTok about like a week and a half ago. Uh, one of my posts went viral uh, 5.4 million views, right? Uh, within like a week. And like, I'm talking about 900 negative comments. Of course. Yeah. People are gonna oh, that dude, yeah. uh, $1,800 for a single ATM, any shit. Oh, really? That ain't shit. How, how many hours are you have to work for that $1,800? 40 hours? Yeah, exactly. I didn't work shit. I worked 20 hours, but now I don't really work uh, for, for anything because guess what? I got employees. Right. So I got my employees on payroll and they could go ahead and fill out those ATMs. So at the end of the day, they, they, they're small minded. You know, yeah. that's what you got to think about. Yeah. That's the difference between a wantrepreneur and an entrepreneur. You got to have vision. If I didn't have vision, if I didn't have the leadership qualities, if I didn't uh, lead by example, at the end of the day, the people that work for me wouldn't work for me. Yeah. I have a, a previous ex uh, retired uh, police sergeant who is my chief operating officer that runs my multi million dollar company right now. And the reason why, because he knows we're going to be an eight figure company by March of 2023. Mm, Fact. Bam. Right now we pull in around $600,000 a month. Bam. Okay. That's fire. I do 250 K a year. That's what I make now a week, bro. All Damn. right. That's what I make. Wow. A week. My life has completely changed because of the vision and the execution that I have and the self belief I have in myself and my skills. So at the end of the day, if you always got haters, if you have that dream of starting your own business, dude, fuck what everybody thinks. Yeah. I'm sorry for, for cussing, but yeah. fuck what everybody no, thinks, fine. guys. It's fresh and fit, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Say whatever you want, man. Yeah. Like uh, what's for you is what's for you guys. And if what I'm telling you right now is if you're scared, trust me. Everybody was scared. Yep. Guarantee you, Myron and Fresh were scared when they started this podcast. Yeah, for sure. Guarantee you, I was scared when I left law enforcement, even though I was making $100,000 off my side hustle already. And my boy right here, COO, he was just like, what the fuck are you doing here, bro? Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. And literally that day, I, uh, I had another detective was like, you know, you're not going to get rich being a cop, right? And I was yeah. just like, damn, this is like the second person. Yeah. Same day. I was like, it's a sign. I was just like, fuck it. I put my two weeks. Everybody was fucking shocked. Yeah. And guess what happens? Fucking over a hundred officers come to my little section of, of the department. And they're like, Hey, what PD are you going to? Yeah. They assume you're going to leave, go somewhere else. And yeah. I'm like, what agency are you going to? Yeah, bro. And I'm like, 
I'm leaving law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And that dramatic change in their fucking faces was fucking memorable, dude. I remember when I said I was going to resign, everyone looked at me like I was crazy, too. Yeah. They're like, so what are you going to do? They can't fathom it. Pension. They can't, they can't bro. <laughs> Benefits. Bro, you, Go on. You, you had certain sergeants, right, that never fucking did any type of proactive work, never even fucking arrested somebody with a gun, never fucking, it, actually, they're, they're fucking pencil pusher. Yeah. All right? All they got, I mean, not, not to bag on anybody that got a degree. If you got a degree, more props to you. You got discipline, and I think that's a solid foundation for anything that you want to do in life. But at the end of the day, this dude just had a master's degree, and he was talking shit, saying like, oh, you're doing ATMs? He's like, oh, Okay, and then he's fucking bashing me with the fucking other sergeants and <laughs> shit. Like, I don't know, dude. Yeah. It's fucking high school. It's a yeah. toxic environment. People don't want to see you fucking grow up. Yeah. But at the end of the day, hey, that's why he's there. I'm fucking here. Yeah. So with that being said, bro, I go and um so 18 months in, you got you leveraged uh <clears throat> credit to get six ATMs. Um yep. at this point, you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year with six ATMs. Bro, that's where I think we yeah. were, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. So it, it was actually like around 120, 130. Okay, so cool. with a fraction of the work. With a fraction of the work, bro. Yeah. With a fraction of the work. And I get it. There is naysayers. They're like, oh, cash is going away. Um, but don't you got to be strapped? You know? No, it's all common sense. Yeah. You know, that's that's why I love being in law enforcement because it basically makes you think, you yeah. know, you got to articulate the shit out of everything when you're yeah. running warrants. Yeah. So you see everything from a different perspective when you come from law enforcement. That way, that's why the transition to uh, what I'm doing now, entrepreneurship, full-time entrepreneurship, I'm not going to lie. It was a lot easier at this age after the experience that I had. And you know, remember fresh, I was talking, I was just like, man, did you have any experience with podcasts? You were like, no, nah, man, that's off just personal experience, what I know, who I know, and how you guys met. That's how I met a lot of my key players was online. Yeah. You know, I got a call center. I got I got a department with just full text to help people one on one and all that. And I'll get I'll get into what I actually do in a minute. But ultimately, man, what's for you is what's for you. Yeah. So to go back to that, um, and I know it's going to sound cliche, but I like the fact that you're like, hey, man, you guys should read this book about interviews because that's how I started digital marketing. Mm -hmm. So digital marketing was actually where it everything got on steroids. And it was from one book. It was called Digital Millionaire. And um, Digital Millionaire, I read it. You know, I, it built foundation with me. And I was just like, man, this shit is cool. It's like you can sell information online hmm. if, you're, if you're like an expert in your niche. And the and what really like got my attention is this dude did like a webinar and he made forty thousand dollars in like 15 minutes. And I was like, fuck, man. And in and, and, and 15 minutes, I only made like thirty two dollars. So it's yeah. like it's like levels to the game, bro, yeah, that yeah. people can't phantom. They're just like, huh? Right. So now. Uh, my circle, man, I'm like the poorest millionaire in my circle. Yeah. Everybody else, dude, is like hitting million dollar months. Yeah. There, there's dudes. I mean, we 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 just uh, we went to the Click Funnels in Orlando last month, mm -hmm. dude. There was a cat that was uh, has multiple companies making four hundred million dollars a year. God damn. Sick. Damn. Sick money, dude. Half, half a billion a year, pretty bro, much almost. Killing the game, bro. Killing the game, and I'm like, wow, that is goals, right? Mm -hmm. But hey, that's what you actually go and you learn when you surround yourself with winners. And to go back to that to that question I asked you guys, you want to become a millionaire right now. For everybody that's watching this right now, you want to become a millionaire right now? Surround yourself with millionaires. I'm telling you right now, it will completely change your actual mindset, guys. I'm telling you, sure. it is dramatic. So to go back into digital marketing, I saw, I joined a bunch of Facebook groups. And in the ATM industry, man, I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of haters. Yeah. There's a lot of haters. I'm pretty sure you guys got hate from, you know, starting your podcast or whatnot, competitors and all that jazz. But in the ATM industry, Facebook groups is key. That's where you learn a lot of your information. So uh, if you guys are interested in uh, actual ATMs, learning the industry, learning how to make passive income, I suggest you guys actually join our Facebook group. ATM Business for Beginners is one of the largest right now. But to go back with that, I joined these other groups and automatically, bro, I was asking questions. They were like, are you stupid? Like, why are you asking these questions in here? Like, go research it yourself. I'm like, bro, like, I'm a grown ass man. Mm -hmm. You don't know what I've done before. Mm -hmm. I ain't over here a keyboard warrior. I slapped the shit out of you. <laughs> so with that being said, I set up my own Facebook group mm -hmm. and I went ahead and I started with like literally three. I learned digital marketing. I invested in myself. 150,000 in the past two years. Mm -hmm. Learned from different mentors, different millionaires. Mm -hmm. 
that are in this business, this niche. Yeah, of ATMs. And, and, and ATMs, digital marketing, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> how to actually market yourself, your brand. Yeah. You know, and I took key aspects of every program and I made my own. Bam. Okay. And then ultimately, I learned how to build funnels. I learned how to build websites. I, I learned how to do content. Dude, I wasn't on social media. And this is for the non believers right here that you can't do the same thing right now. Is look, I wasn't on social media for seven years. You weren't on social media yeah, for that long yeah. either. They, they, disincent they disincentivize you to be on social media when you're in law enforcement. They don't want you on there at all. Exactly. So I wasn't on there for seven years, guys. Once I got on there, within a year, I had made almost $2 million. So if you're on social media watching little TikToks, fucking watching girls and shit, hey, what the fuck are you doing? Your parents didn't come to this country to work hard for you to fucking be watching TikToks and jacking off right there in your room. Facts. Stupid. Exactly. So at the end of the day, get to work. Leverage what it has right now. Yesterday, I was talking to a multimillionaire tech. He's like, you got to be an innovator, bro. You got to go and create something that people, you're going to change the environment. Don't do the influencing consulting. And I was like, well, no disrespect, but how much did, did you clear last year? And he was just like, well, you know, like around four mil. I was like, that's cool. Um, how much is your, your company clear? I was just like, we just cleared six. We're going to clear eight at the end of this year. He was just like, Bro, what's your number? <laughs> like literally, yeah. like yeah. it flipped. Yeah. Like it flipped. And with me, like I said, I'm very low key. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I'm not here fluffing. I'm not saying here, oh, I'm a millionaire. Nah, I'm telling you right now, guys, there are guys making $400 million, guys making million dollar months, different levels to this game. And I see somebody doing cap, but check this out. Look, <laughs> I, I, I love proving people wrong, dude. Bob, pull up the yeah, w, on yes, W Money <laughs> Mondays, man. Yeah. Yep, I can see it right there. Yeah, gross, yeah, 6.4M. Damn. I see it on the stripe. Damn. Look, this is how much we made this month. There you go, Fresh. Hold on, bro. Hold on. Go back, go back to the other screen. Go yeah, back yeah, to the yeah. other screen. Yeah, you can see it right there. Yeah. That is not, he's no, no cap in the wraps, man. And that's the stripe account. You can't fake that. Hold on. Uh, I, need, I need the other I got, screen. I got to refresh. Hold on. Yo, he's not playing, guys. <laughs> this is legit. Six million. He's not playing, nah, bro. Nah. So we, I got a question for you, real quick. Yeah, yeah. So, how do so let's say someone wants to get into this and they want to you know they're they, you know what hey i got some good credit i got some money you know i'm, I'm do, working a job and i got some side money i want to invest in a side hustle um how are they going to actually make money from how do, how's the how does the profiting actually work from putting the atm machines into an establishment yeah that's a great question so to simplify it for everybody that's watching right now you basically are going to set up your atm there you're going to put two to three thousand dollars in there or however much you want these atms hold about twenty thousand dollars okay okay so depending on how passive you how want much it does to the be, atm cost itself to procure twenty three hundred dollars oh wow it's nothing yeah it's, that's, when you, <laughs> dude, when i thought it was way more bro i know you're in real estate yeah i love real estate it's yeah. great for wealth preservation uh, for longevity purposes uh but you have to wait a certain amount of years in order to get the money out from the equity and all that of jazz course, right yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if you're going to go rent i mean you can always get him he's he's a, a landlord uh owner or uh what, what do you call it uh not landlord owner but uh what else do they call owners slumlords oh, slumlords yeah, 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 yeah. He's, a, he's a slumlord so so with that being said atms mm -hmm. if somebody got like 10k yeah okay right now with inflation you yep. can't even invest and go buy a rental property that's true you, you can't. can't yep you that's can't facts. and then nope. you got all these gurus saying like hey you could go and leverage, you know, FHA. Oh, you, know, you could do the bird method. I'm gonna tell you something right now. Faster, easier, simpler. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. You know, majority of America. I was exposed to majority of America when I went into digital marketing, getting it back on social media, and I found out that there's a lot of lazy people out there. Oh yeah, man. I'm noticing that too. <laughs> Bro, being on when, the internet. When yeah. you're exposed to everybody else in the country, you're like, wow. You're like, this shit's crazy. Mm -hmm. And not to bad mouth anybody, but I'm telling you right now, people want faster, easier, simpler. Yeah. And that's those are my three terms. This is what I teach every single one of my employees, all my managers, all my supervisors, even clients. Yeah. And I tell them, if you're able to create a product that there's an actual void in, okay, in the market, which in the ATM industry, the reason why we're, I guess you could say top G, mm -hmm. is the fact that 
we do a one-stop shop. Okay. We provide the ATM, we provide the internet, we provide free processing, which is the network that facilitates the bank transactions. And then guess what? We even do the hard work. We do the labor. We go ahead and find your location, bro. You know how much time it takes to find locations for these machines? A lot of people are like, oh man, everywhere I go, uh, you can't place an ATM anywhere. No, we're finding 60 to 70 locations a month. Mm -hmm. We're changing lives. We're changing that 23-year-old truck driver that's making $5,000 now. He just bought his brand new Hellcat. We're changing the, the single mom of three kids, has multiple businesses, and she's generating thousands of her machines. Mm -hmm. we've, we've, we've changed so many lives, over 1,400 clients in the past two years. It's been an amazing ride, bro. And they we're just getting started. Mm -hmm. I have hired the best of the best in digital marketing, but I also train them. And, and just like you were saying, man, you got to lead by example. Yeah. So I run it like a task force. I run it, I go on the briefings every single month and I motivate these guys. I tell them, hey, this is how we're going to do it. These are the quotas. You guys give me these numbers. I'm going to reward you. Last, last month when we were in Miami, my best consultant, 21 years old from Australia. Oh, I Asian, mean. Okay, mm -hmm. go, go ahead and I actually got him a visa to come to the States mm -hmm. to come and work for me out of San Diego. Mm -hmm. Dude's making twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month at mm. the age of 21. That's and he wild. met me through the internet, bro. Damn. Yeah. So question. So, so you, you place the ATMs in. So does the, the place that you place it at, do they like pay you like a uh, rent, I guess, to kind of borrow the ATM for their customers? Like, how do you get that that monthly income from the ATM? Because like you're obviously putting all the work. You're you're putting the ATM in there. You're putting your own cash in there. You're even facilitating, I guess, probably the bank pickups where they come in and load the cash in there. So you're basically doing everything for the establishment so that they can have you know that ease of cash for their customers. Do they pay you like a monthly fee to have an ATM there? Or how does that go? Yeah, so it really depends on the location. Okay. So it, it's it's all about network negotiating, yeah. how you present yourself, the value. At the end of the day, people can actually get these locations for free. And how can they do that? I'll give you guys a golden nugget. So merchant services, merchant services, the little credit card machines. Well, a lot of people don't know because a lot of people are not business owners of these yeah. liquor stores, dispensaries, and all that jazz. Well, they actually get charged. They get charged a percentage, a percentage. like two to three percent, and yeah. that can equal depending on the actual flow of customers coming into that location up to the thousands, yeah. 15,000, 1500, depending if it's a slow location. But at the end of the day, you could go in there as the hero and be like, look, I'm going to offer you this machine. All you got to do is just push your crowd to take out cash and to use it for your services. And guess what? You're going to save thousands of dollars ah, off the merchant services. So now you got them hyped. Because who doesn't like to save money? Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, $1,500 to one person could be a car payment, right? So with that, that's a way you could get, or that's a tactic that I actually go and I show my clients uh, one of several tactics that how they could get locations for free. But now let's go back to what my team does. Mm -hmm. What my team does is basically the process looks like this. We help you with absolutely everything from A to Z. It's a four week process. We go ahead and if you've never done an LLC, we got your back. We'll, we'll do the LLC, the EIN with you. We'll set you up with the business bank account in 2022. Okay, it is very difficult to go find a business bank account for the ATM industry. And the reason why is because you got a bunch of clown gurus telling people to go take out personal checking accounts for their business. Oh, and what ends yeah. up happening, it gets red flagged by the actual bank. And then guess what? It ruins it for everybody else. Legitimate business owners like myself, get them, you guys, or anybody else trying to get into the ATM industry. And we go ahead and now we have to deal with that issue. So what my company does is we actually go and negotiate for you. We'll go and negotiate with the banks and let them know like, hey, um, do you guys have to, uh, a business bank account for ATMs? Yes. Okay, what documents do you need? We'll set you up with all the documents. Yeah. They go in there, boom, do the thing with their banker. Next step, second week, we ship out your ATM. We get you trained up with our technicians. One of the only companies that does this, man, because the previous company that I was with when I first started, huge corporation, wouldn't answer an email, delayed a bunch of my ATM deliveries when I had clients waiting for two, three weeks. A lot of loss, uh, lost a lot of business because of them. Yeah. So I told myself, I was like, man, if I start anything like this, 
I'm going to be the best of the best when it comes to customer care. I want to make sure that my clients are winning. And at the end of the day, I want them to go ahead and actually be successful. Yeah. I want them to be successful. So and uh, I can see why the banks would be iffy on this because yeah. it's it's cash. Mm-hmm. So for as you guys are probably wondering, like, well, why would they be scared to give you a bank account for, for any AT, ATM business? Well, because they know that there's going to be a lot of cash flow going through and a lot of crooks, unfortunately, you know, make fake businesses a lot of times that are cash dependent and, you know, use that to conceal their illicit activity. So the bank, the banks, right, they have to be wary of this and they got to make sure, okay, is this guy actually legit or is he just a drug trafficker or whatever trying to launder money? So absolutely, that's why I could see why it would be very difficult to, you know, get a business bank account uh, for an ATM type business or some type of cash heavy business. That That's a good point. But then also think about it like this. Mm-hmm. Think about it like who would be the bank's competition? You will, you yeah. Will, yeah, because you're an True. independent ATM deployer, so you're lending out your money to other people. How does the banks make money? Think about this. All they, on interest and loans. All on interest. Yeah. So if you got thousands of dollars sitting in the bank account, guess what? You're an idiot. Straight up. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. No, that's true. But at, at the end of the day, you, you got to invest your money. You got to invest your money into assets. And what I like to call ATMs, floating assets. And the reason why I like calling floating assets is because if you get one bad location, let's say you're making, I don't know, like $150, guess what? Move it. Yeah. yeah. It's as simple as that. And it's simple. Your business owner, think, be creative. Yo, you know? I, I'd have like five things I can do to network with a hotel or like a store thinking of where to put ATM already. We'll, we'll plug you, bro. That's crazy, Just talk bro. to get them after this. We'll plug you. Clubs as well. Yeah. Damn. We'll plug you, bro. You guys should leverage that. You guys should be at the club making money while, you know, you're over there. <laughs> no, straight yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I just showed you guys. We just made uh, over $400,000. And I've been out of town like crazy, flying back to Miami, going with my parents. I just came back from Cancun. Guess what? I'm still making money. It's called passive income. Yeah. If you're relying on one source of income, especially if it's active, guess what? You got to be there. You got to spend your time there. True. Yeah. The American dream is doing what the fuck you want to do and leverage time because life is short, guys. I don't even remember my 20s. It was fun, mm-hmm. but I don't remember my 20s. Yeah. Now in my 30s, dude, I'm trying to freaking retire with 40 mil, okay? By that time, I'm 40. That's what I'm looking at. I'm not looking at how I'm going to make another 8 mil like I did this year. Mm-hmm. No, I'm looking, okay, how can we fucking 10X this? Yeah. And we already got all that shit in the works. So I'm launching different programs, but not to get off, off the subject. Let's focus on ATMs. I mean, with ATMs, man, you, you, it's, it's, a great, it's a great investment for anyone who has $10,000 or less. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking to leverage your time, because my team can actually build it for you. And ultimately, if you guys check out the website, atmtogether.com, you guys will see. All the social proof. I'm big on social proof, man. You need it. Yeah, you, you need do. it for business. You need receipts. You need, you need the receipts. You need the numbers. You need the actual clients that will vouch for you and go ahead and be like, yeah, they'll go and uh, and this this stuff works. This is the real deal. It's not a scam because I know online people, they blow smoke. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, you'll be a millionaire. Oh, you'll do this. And I'm going to tell you this right now. You're not going to get rich off of one ATM. No. It's a volume game. We might get you a, a solid location, a golden goose that makes you a thousand dollars for one location, which is solid. Which would be a month, weekly, what a would month, that be? a month. Okay, yeah, yep. a month, yep. yeah, yeah. but solid. But you got to think about it. passive. Yeah, yeah. So at the end of the day, even if you're going to go and refill it you yourself, don't do anything. It's only taking like five to twenty minutes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not that difficult. And I used to work an additional forty to sixty hours, guys, to make the same amount of money that I did with my ATM business when I first started all this, it made me sick to myself. I was like, man, I wish I would have done this a long time ago, mm-hmm, man. Yeah, mm-hmm. But what you don't know is what you don't know. Mm-hmm. So so what, what I got for the folks, man, um, I know you guys have been seeing the links right now. Um, we actually got a special Thanksgiving ATM raffle. So if you guys want to start, I'm going to actually hook you guys up, the viewers, um, with your own ATM. We're getting out a, nice. a, a ATM, which is a high sun Halo 2. Google it. And a free location done by my sales team. And I'm actually going to give you $500 in cash. So all you got to do is just check out my IG, guys. That's going to be Instagram, Paul Alex Espinoza. And that's going to be with a Z. Check the links in the comment. And then go hit up, get them. Hey, we're looking for good, solid people that want to work from home as well. And we're always looking. Like I said, majority of my staff, 17 employees uh, in a year and a half, everybody's 20 under the age of 25, except for, I think, me and Getem and, and Mike. But other than that, everybody else is youngsters making money. You know, I, I and I yeah. tell them this. I was like, you guys ride with me. I'm going to make you guys all millionaires. I 
I, I know, I know, I see the vision. So for the average person that wants to hit that six figures, right? Well, how many ATMs do you think they'll need to, uh, on average, how many yeah. ATMs would they need to be able to earn 10K a month? It would really vary on your location. Okay. okay? I'm going to give you a great example. We have one employee goes by uh, Santino. And he's actually uh, first responder law enforcement as well. Okay. Nice. And this dude, he got hell of his ATMs in strip clubs. Okay. So this dude had a place to have them. Exactly. So he got 20 locations. Dude makes 15K a month passively, bro. Nice. Right. With 20 ATMs. With 20 ATMs. Nice. 15K. And that's a good that's chunk of change. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, yeah. that's good. But for not doing anything. So All he has this... to do is just load the money in there, right? Yep. Okay. And check this out. He just landed about 80 Dunkin' Donuts, bro, in the East Coast. Mm. 80. Damn. Damn. I know. He's going to be cash flowing, bro. And I'm like, you sure you want to work for me, bro? He's like, yeah, you guys cool as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, the possibilities are there. Yeah. You guys got to go ahead and actually get it. I mean, life's too short to not, man. Okay. But no. yeah. Hey, man. I mean, hey, sounds very promising. I mean, how... Ten I mean, 10 to 12, it, it, it sounds to me like if you have somewhere between 10 to 20 ATMs, that will get get you, hopefully, with, depending on locations, into that 10K a month, uh, which which I think for a lot of people would be, imagine that, guys, an extra 100 grand a year. Yo, I'm thinking right now, strip club, club, hotel, gambling. Bro, I, I got so many ideas, bro. And dispensaries people... is a good idea, too, because, I mean, dispensaries, a lot of people don't know this. It's very difficult for them to deal with the banking system because banks are federally insured. And as you guys know, marijuana is illegal federally. So that's why dispensaries get robbed all the time is because they're cash heavy. So it allows them to kind of keep money, at, you know, within an ATM, which would, <laughs> you know, make it a little bit safer for them. Yeah. No, yeah. absolutely, man. You're going to go uh, pitch it to titsies and all that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of the owners so like, yo, lady, they trust, they trust me, bro. I was just kidding. He was like, yeah, no, actually. That's crazy. But yeah. no, I can see where, like, you know, you could get, definitely get the creative juices going and uh, flowing and, like, you know, literally, because at the end of the day, guys, cash ain't going anywhere. You know what I mean? No, I know we're not. moving slowly into a cashless society, but... Um, people are always going to need cash. You know, there's still a lot of people that don't trust, you know, digital forms of currency for a good reason, I see. Yeah, you know? and look, some of you don't know what you want to do in life. It's fine. This might be an option for you because, look, off rip, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like, I tried uh, marketing. I tried uh, digital marketing. I tried e-commerce. That didn't work for me. But you to work for me. So this might be, be an option for you. So check it out. Okay, someone asked, can you, they do this in Canada? Yeah. Okay. We actually serve Canada. We just hooked up with um, an actually a service provider out there that can actually facilitate the ATMs. My team directly, they'll go ahead and actually find the locations for you and we'll actually help you with the, uh, I believe it's the corporation. Mm. They don't call it the LLC. They call it the corporation now in Canada. So we'll be able to help you with all that uh, jazz and we'll, we'll set you up. And by the way, because I'm reading some and of the comments. This is Paige here as well, guys. Yeah. On, on Instagram. So uh, I'm reading the comments and people are like, oh, he's selling the dream for the course. I don't even sell a course, okay? I provide that information for free. If you could go ahead and do it, phenomenal, okay? What I provide is services. So at the end of the day, the mm. game changer here is the services. I provide you with the machine. I provide you with the internet. I provide you with the actual physical location. This is a tangible business. This ain't no little uh, drop shipping course uh, or none like that jazz. You I, actually give them the infrastructure. I give them the infrastructure. You, this you is, give it to them. like it's. That's, this yeah, a is lot. a business. That's a yeah. lot. This is a business. And for, for under 10K, it's nothing. It's nothing. I mean, most people so, just sell you a course and I say, hey, you figure it out. Yeah, you give you the full yeah. infrastructure. That's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They yeah. get your LLC set up. It handles a bank it, a bank issue for you, which that's a whole other thing. So, you know, that's 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 great stuff. All man. the learning curves you have to take by yourself, he's covering for you pretty much. Yeah. So if you're not lazy, you could actually win. Bam. Yeah. Uh, chats real quick or? Yeah. All right. I'll hit these chats and then. Last um, thoughts. Yeah. Um, cool. Where, where are we at, Chris? Michael, Michael Mitro, Mitro. Dollar, thank you so much. And then we got Eric Lugo goes, I'm 16 working and in the gym. I can't do uh, crypto dropshipping or anything that gets taxed because of my age. How should I make money? I mean, they got you You just heard it right here, right, my friend? Uh, you can get involved in this. Uh, we got if uh, 5.0 say the reason for the stop is license plate light bulb is out. Do the cat dash ninjas uh, 20 bucks and that's from sauce racing. <laughs> okay. I mean, oh, if 5.0 says the reason for the stop is a license plate. A light bulb as I'll do the dash. Okay. Slayer behind the all seeing eye tattoo. Oh, family member. So I got this back in 2017 before you start seeing a shitload of people getting this. Mm. At the end of the day, no, I'm not part of uh, Illuminati, Illuminati and all that <laughs> shit. I get that shit all the time. But, <laughs> you know, back in the department, people were like, man, you got some crazy ass tattoos. I was like, man, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I you, see. Should, you should join a club, bro. It's fine. <laughs> Grease Junkies, do it yourself. Goes, this guy even sits like a cop. This dude. Bro, <laughs> and, uh, I got nah. a bad lower back, bro. Yeah. That's messed up. <laughs> uh, Baby Blair, I see he's 10xing his money. Okay. 
And then uh, Ballin goes, uh, can I do this ATM business in Canada? Oh, yeah. And he just, we just answered that one. So, yeah, um, yeah man. So what, what, anything else you want to let the people know or any, where they can find you Actually, if they got more Rook questions? Quick, got him. How has this business changed your life? Because you, you've you been pretty much like with him the whole way. Like, how has this changed your life? So it's, it's funny you mention that, right? So with this business, I left a quarter million a year profession. So that's to tell you something, yeah. right? And my thing is, I like to change lives, whether it was in law enforcement, whether it's saving lives, to now changing people's lives on the entrepreneurial journey. So what I found is most people don't have access to the information to form their own business. Mm -hmm. They're stuck working nine to fives, right? Yeah. So we're able to bring them the stepping stones to get into other businesses also, right? Mm. So this may be the only thing achievable to them. They got family, they got kids, they have working nine hours, nine, 90 hours a week. What are they supposed to do? So this is one of the only achievable businesses that they're able to, because my parents are immigrants, right? We actually have that. A lot of clients, immigrants, police officers, federal judges, DEA agents, mm. right? Yeah. And they're looking for something else to get away from that work life and get into business. Mm. And this is the only option for them. Cool. Right. Yeah. Point. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy, man. I mean, like if the clientele just ranges. We got like some federal judges. We got first responders. Nice. We got DEA. We got yeah. HSI. We got everybody making some some Dude, money on the side, it's, man. It's, it's, all, it's all side hustle. Yeah. At the end of the day, you guys need multiple side hustles. Yeah, you can't just For sure uh, go ahead and focus just on one because once again, like we said, hey, uh, you're one step away from poverty if you only have your nine to five income. Because at the end of the day, um, even though I have fulfillment with law enforcement, I still back the uh, the blue law enforcement, all that jazz. Hey, check this out. Something could have happened, and then guess what? No more check, no more nine to five. I gotta sell my house. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to living in my mom's basement. Yep. Like, nah. Uh -uh. Yeah, the average millionaire has about six to seven streams of income, man. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, it's very important, guys, because your job can be taken away from you. Anything can happen. So, exactly. you always want to have multiple streams of income. And this, to me, sounds like a you know fantastic way to make some money on the side without necessarily spending a lot of time. So you can still keep that profession if you enjoy it. People always be able say, to make money. "How do we make passive income?" There you go. Bam. There's another option. Bam. And you don't have to have as much. I mean, let's be honest. I'm a real estate investor. I, I, I tell you guys all the time, invest in real estate. You might not have $100,000 to put into a goddamn house right now with the interest rates at, money. you know, damn near 8%. So this might be an opportunity for you where you got, you know, $10,000 or below. You can get into this and start making yourself, you know, an extra $1,000 a month or whatever it may be. And that's a 10% return on cash, which is fantastic. At that's least, what I shoot for on my real estate deals anyway. At least this should inspire you to actually make a change because, look, you could have kept with doing your your police job but you might end up you know yeah god forbid uh passed away yeah. so it's an option guys uh, we got this last shot here as well uh fake ashy goes 100 bucks goes if that doesn't motivate you to change your life i don't know what Facts, will bro. absolutely my friend i appreciate <laughs> that oh chris go ahead Double you got chris, chris. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, man, guys, all of his links are below. If you guys want to enter the raffle and get yourself a free ATM and get uh, kickstarted on this uh, journey to passive income, go ahead and click that link below. It's going to be at the top of the description and also the top comment. And uh, yeah, man, Paul, thanks for coming by. Bro. This, this was awesome. awesome interview, man. Great interview, man. No, yep. absolutely, man. It was awesome. Thank you, bro. No. Appreciate you. Absolutely, Fresh. man. All right, man. Oh, man. Good job, man. Guys, yeah. we'll catch you back yeah, here in a little bit with some uh, with after hours, man. Hope you guys enjoyed the war stories it's and gonna you be know, a crazy the stories show, on how to make some extra money. Yeah, it's going to be wild. So we'll catch you guys back here at what time, Chris? Like 10.30? Uh, 10, yeah. All right, about 10, 10.30, guys. Love you all. Peace. Peace.